الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء والمرسلين وعلى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وعلى المؤمنون وعلى المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات from our God. Praise belongs to Allah, the guardian evolver of all the systems of knowledge. May the prayers and peace be upon the prophets and the messengers, all of them, and upon our prophet Muhammad, and upon his family, and upon his descendants, his companions rather, and upon the Muslim men and women and upon the believing men and women. Um, didn't have much time to prepare. I never have a completed thing. My life is just in wreck in terms of organization. So um, inshallah it would be a good talk, you know. Um, I want to talk about, and I hope I'm able to cover it in some um, understandable fashion, um, man's quest to fulfill his full potential, or the human person's quest to fulfill his full potential. That's actually the purpose of a human life, you know, is to fulfill your full, full potential. In fact, that is. A bad law. That is the worship of God. Right? The rituals that we perform and the practices that we do are only a sign pointing someplace. Right? They're pointing to a greater reality. They're pointing to a higher form of consciousness. An elevation of understanding who you are, of who you truly are as a human being. 
You know, most of the problem is that we don't know who we are as a human being. We have so many influences coming at us, trying to shape the human person, because we're talking about an internal dynamic here. There's some, we're talking about something internal. So it has to be an internal transformation that takes place, right? Even the rite of Hajj is actually an internal journey. It's not an external journey, right? The whole purpose of Hajj is an internal journey. The fast itself is an internal journey. It's not an external journey. If you just lose weight, that's not good enough. And you didn't gain anything out of the fast. The purpose of the fast is not the fast. The purpose of the fast is pointing to something. Right? That's the goal. Right? You don't want to get caught up in literalism <coughs> or ritualism. Where you're doing rituals you don't understand. Right? Or reciting stuff that you don't understand. You want to know. You know, the ancient Egyptians said, know thyself. This was the creed of the ancient Greeks, too. Know thyself. Right? In the Quran it says, Ikra bismi rabbika ladiya khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord. Right? Read in the name of your Lord. What are we reading? We're reading everything in creation. Every conceivable thing in creation. And this reading is a kind of worship. It's not just reading the Quran. This reading is a kind of worship if the orientation is right, right? If you have the right orientation, meditation, even on secular knowledge, can be a kind of so-called secular knowledge, can be a kind of worship. The doctor who studies medicine with the understanding in his heart that this is a revelation of God approaches medicine entirely different from someone who doesn't. And that can go for just about any field. <clears throat> the Quran also says, referring to the prophet, but referring to all of us, Alam nashra laka sakraka. Did we not expand your heart? And remove from you your burden? Heart here stands for a certain kind of intelligence. Right? A certain kind of, in, a certain kind of intelligence. When when it's mentioning the heart in the Quran, it's talking about a certain form of intelligence. <clears throat> the Qalb in Quranic Arabic refers to a spiritual organ, an inner locus of mystical awareness, a purely spiritual dimension of the mind in which suprasensible and transrational aspects of reality are disposed to the true believer, are disclosed to the true believer. Hence this spiritual entity has an infinite spaciousness or comprehensiveness. This is not the dry intellect or the dry reasoning of mathematics or the SAT test, right? It's not that kind of dry reason. In fact, intelligence, there are different kinds of intelligences, right? And not all, not all people share them equally, right? Some people share more than others. There's a kind of intelligence that requires you to assess a situation that you encounter, and you know what to say, how to say it, in order to get what you want. You have highly intelligent people who have SAT scores, right? Who can reason in terms of abstract 
grammar and abstract mathematics. <coughs> but they have no intelligence when it comes with dealing with other people. Right? So, don't think of intelligence as a myoptic, a narrow concept, right? That only exists in the classroom. If you're looking for, if you're reading the Quran and looking for what, how your own soul is responding to it, it will inform that kind of intelligence. These kinds of multiple intelligences that I'm talking about. Right? There's a kind of intelligence that people have spatial intelligence, right? Knowing how to get around in the city, right? Without a map or GPS, right? That's a kind of spatial intelligence. I have none of that, right? I have no spatial intelligence. I love the iPhone for that reason. I can just put in the coordinates and it will take me where I want to go, unless I do something wrong. So, the verse goes on, الَّذِي أَنُقَدَ ذَحْرَكَ which was, which weighed down your back. So he expanded the special kind of intelligence in the prophet, and thereby by extension to all of us, right? And he removed this burden that was on his back, right? Which weighed him down. What kind of burden was this? Now the prophet had a unique experience, right? The prophet had the responsibility of the whole world on his back. This was before he became a prophet. This is referring to before he became a prophet. He had the, um, he had assumed um, the desire to transform the whole world. He was concerned about the kinds of universal issues that exist in a society, in his own society. And he would go up to this cave and he would meditate, and he would meditate, and he would meditate. And then he would come down and he would socialize with his people and he saw the kind of stark disparity. And it was a burden that was on his back. It was a burden that was on his soul. And Allah released that burden and gave him the message of liberation. So which weighed down your back, then it goes on. And we exalted you, right? So that you will be remembered, for your remembrance. And we recite his name five times a day, right? All over the world, people all over the world remember and recite his name. Then it goes on. Indeed, verily, surely, with difficulty there is ease. Now it doesn't just mention it once, it mentions it twice. In the Ma'usri Yusra. So why twice? Why not once? Didn't we get the message the first time? It's talking about a process of life. This process of life, right? You have these great accomplishments, and then you go back into the valley. You rise up to the mountain, and you go back to the valley. You have, you have a, a accomplishment, and then you have defeat. You have accomplishment, and then you have defeat. This is the very nature of life, right? Nothing is permanent. Everything is constantly changing, right? And this is alluding to that. Surely with difficulty there is ease. What lies in the balance here? Patience. Then the Quran says, فَإِذَا So when you are free, when the concerns of the world, when the responsibilities of the world when, you, when, when the soul is free and open to reflect, right? Work hard, right? فَإِذَا رَبِّكَ فَرْدَى And to your Lord, direct your, uh, and make 
make your Lord your exclusive object of desire. Now, in this quest for man to understand himself, it has been a quest It has been an internal quest. You know, in um, the Declaration of Independence, it says, all experience has shown that mankind is more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. The Quran says, God does not change what is in a people until they change what is in themselves. Again, the Declaration of Independence says, all experience has shown that mankind is more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Why is that? Why do we get lulled in complacency, in a kind of complacency that we really don't really like? But we persist in this. Why do we do that? You know, in primitive societies, Imitation, you know, imitation in social organizations is one of the main features that people who study society have gleaned from social organization. Social uh, structures. One of the things that arises is this idea of imitation. We have a natural proclivity to imitate one another, right? This is the nature of the human being in a social setting. In fact, there is no human being without a social setting. Let me say it again. There is no human being without a social setting. This is the big trick that they did on us, convince, trying to convince us that we can make it alone individually. That's the big trick. You can't make it alone. You are the nature of the relationships that you build. And you should try to build as many relationships as you possibly can. But on a footing of equality, or on a footing of respect. You see, let me clarify this for internal Muslim dialogue. When immigrant Muslims say we all believe in the same thing, they mean you must believe like I believe. uniformity. <clears throat> Unity is not uniformity. Right? Unity is when separate entities come to par, come together in order to form, form a whole. They're all different. Right? But they have mutually agreed to come together because they have like interests. Uniformity Someone's on top and somebody's on bottom. <laughs> because somebody is determining what uniform is going to be wore. Use uniformity with unity. Right? So getting back to primitive societies and this idea about imitation. 
So it's intrinsic in human nature, this idea to imitate. Uh, and historians call it uh, um, I always have trouble with these Latin and Greek words. Me. My, my, my mises, that's it, my mises. It's directed toward the older generation. The imitation is directed toward the older generation in primitive societies and towards dead ancestors who stand unseen but not unfelt. Now, if you've ever been around the Bengali community, one of the things you will notice is that they, they celebrate the ancestors, but also the Indonesians, and, and, and the Malaysians may have kept it undercover from him, but I think they do it too, especially in the village, right? Uh, they go and they have these annual things in terms of honoring the ancestors. They celebrate their birthdays and everything, and their deaths, right? As if they're still living, I mean, they're felt. They're felt, it's viable members of the society, of the, of the family, although they're no longer physically there, right? He says, ancestors who stand unseen but not unfelt at the back of living, at the back of living elders, reinforcing their prestige in a society where imitation is thus directed toward, directed backwards toward the past, customs rule. We can see this in the Middle East. I just read an article in the, in the Wall Street Journal, and the article was talking about Islam, but it was really talking about Arab society and the, and, and the, and the customs that have evolved within that context. Because the Indonesians and the uh, Malaysians, uh, who number in, in substantial numbers of Muslims, right? The largest uh, Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. They don't have the same kind of problems that the Arabs have. When they talk about Islam, they talk about it as if it's a, um, um, as if it's a monolith. It's not. It's not a monolith. You go into these different societies, and they all practice Islam just a little differently, right? There are no beheadings in uh, Indonesia or Malaysia. There's no stone in there, right? But if you don't know, if you're not informed about these things, you don't know, and you begin mouthing off, you know, saying stuff about Islam that you don't know, you know? I'm talking about Muslims here. I'm not talking about the outside world. They have an excuse for not knowing. You don't. Hmm. Right? <clears throat> he says, custom rules and society remains static. On the other hand, in societies in process of civilization, imitation is directed towards creative personalities who command a following because they are pioneers. Right? Now, we just have the wrong pioneers right now and the wrong personalities who we, you know, who we want to imitate. But believe me, people, the people who design a society know that mimicry and imitation is a powerful teaching mechanism for the social organization of society, especially for winning the youth, right? Especially for you. You know, I remember growing up, I was a big James Bond fan, right? I had my James Bond attache case, you know. You young people probably don't know about the James Bond attache case, right? Well, I thought that was the fanciest toy I ever had, right? So, He says, on the other hand, in societies and process of civilization, mimicry is directed towards creative personalities to command a following because they are pioneers. In such societies, custom is broken 
and society is in dynamic motion along a course of change and growth. Right? But it's this balance that one must keep between custom and progress. And progress doesn't follow a linear line, meaning that you have ups and downs. In where in them I was free your strength, in them I was free your strength, right? Surely with difficulty there is ease. There is not a straight line for progress, right? But progress, if you're on the right course, is the goal, right? The question is, who do you imitate? Who's your idol? You don't just wear the clothes that you wear for no reason at all, right? You wear those clothes for a reason. Some white guy in Madison Avenue sat down and designed those clothes and marketed those clothes with the desire that you would imitate those fashions that he created. Right? And those fashions enter the mind because they're symbolic symbols that enter the mind and affect the consciousness. Everything in creation affects the consciousness. Everything. And if you're not designing the self that you want to create for yourself, then somebody else is designing that self. You can design that self. You can design that soul, or you can allow the greater society or some marketeers to design the way you think, the way you dress, who you associate with, the beliefs that you have. You can choose that. This author goes on. He says that primitive societies are old as the human race. What's a primitive society? These are societies with um, very small numbers, right? And a lot of them have meager kind of agriculture and they do kind of hunting and gathering, right? These are primitive societies. They haven't developed the arts and the sciences on the, on the advanced level that Chinese civilization did or Western civilization did or Islamic civilization did. So these are civilizations, right? He says that primitive societies are as old as the human race, but we should more properly have said older. Social and institutional life of a kind is found among some of the higher mammals other than man. And it is clear that mankind could not have become human except in a human environment. This change of sub-man into man which was accomplished in circumstances of which we have no record under the ages of primitive societies was, more profound, was a more profound change, a greater step in growth than any progress which man has yet achieved under the ages of civilization. What he's saying is that the very formation into groups as a society, that there has been no greater accomplishment in the whole history of civilization, greater than that. That's a powerful statement. <clears throat> That's a powerful statement letting you know how powerful the group is. Your group. Hmm. Not just any group. Your group. You have a distinct group. You know, political organizations, they have something that's called the base, right? If someone wants to run for office, the first thing that people who, who give you the money ask, who's your base? Who don't we have to advertise to, in other words? Who can we depend on without going to begging for the vote? Who's your base? Who's your people? Who represents you? This is true in every aspect of society. Every single thing you do in society has this kind of connection. They did a study on blacks, on black males, talking about um, how perceptions affect the kinds of jobs that black males get. Because there's a perception, you know, 
that if they do a lawsuit, then I have to deal with the NAACP, right? Or, you know, that pretty white woman may you'd be interested in him, you know? Or some other thing, right? And this is all based on perceptions. This is all based upon perceptions of the group. Perceptions are a form of reality, you know? Those have impacts on people, whether they get a job or not, right? He goes on, a new civilization is generated through the transition of a society from a static condition to a dynamic activity. Just as it is in the change which produces a civilization out of a primitive society. Meaning that civilization will go through these cycles, right? You have a dominant minority within a civilization, right? We have the dominant minority. They're called wasps, right? That's the dominant minority in Western society, right? What is wasp? That's English what? White Anglo-Saxon. White Anglo-Saxon. Protestant. Yeah, Protestant. That's the dominant member. But there reaches a point at which the dominant member becomes stagnant. They become set in their ways. They don't be dominant. They're not dynamic anymore. Right? And one of the minorities, one of the, the, the one of the lesser minorities within a group rises up to the top and takes over the civilization. It transforms that civilization into a new civilization. It's no longer the same civilization, right? Things don't remain the same. You know, the mustard seed is hard, and to look at it, it looks dead. But when you put it in the place where God intended it to have life, It'll grow. It becomes a big bush, and just one of, it le of its leaves has weight. The mustard seed hardly has any weight. Its leaf, after it grows into a bush, has a weight. But if you put it in the wrong place, nothing will develop. The same is true for human nature, or man, or the soul. It will never reach its full human potential unless it is put in the right place hmm. with the right orientation toward the divine light. Just as plants placed in the sun will turn toward the sun for its sustenance, so must the human being turn his heart and intellect toward the divine to reach his or her full potential. Why is this so? True oppression in the Quran <clears throat> is to put something in its wrong place. You know the word boom, which is translated oppression in the Quran, as volim, as volimun, as volimin, it means to put something in its improper place. Right? So watch out when you're watching that TV, young people, and on the internet. You think it's all powerful? Yeah, it is, because it's trying to pull you in a certain direction. You have to be highly selective and determine the direction that you want to go, not be led like beast of burden. Dogs and cats and animals, in other words. In other words, to have a scholar take out the trash or have a pimp as an imam do you realize during the Cultural Revolution in China, they made the educated classes of people do hard manual labor because they wanted to make everybody equal? Uniformity, people, uniformity, right? Not unity. Well, everybody ain't equal. They just not. As the Quran said, are those who know and those who know not equal? Are the seeing and the blind equal? Hence China was 
wasn't able to develop for decades until they began to respect the dignity and intelligence of the human being. We have to kill this way of thinking among our people that everybody is equal. The only thing we have is the potential to be equal in taqwa. And what is taqwa? Taqwa is this kind of childhood innocence that you're born with, that God has bestowed upon you. This kind of, meaning that you, 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 you're created in the world, in your origin and your nature, with the right orientation, right? That's why there's no or, uh, original sin in this land. You're, you're created with the original nature, with the right orientation, and then the influences of the world. Not of the real world, of the virtual world, of the imagination, of the world of imagination that has been created, created by men. This is the world that leads you astray. Not the world that God has revealed to you. Not that world. <clears throat> Through this divine, through this consciousness of the divine, we find out what our true purpose here on earth is. Allah communicates through the signs and creation and in his, and his holy scriptures and through the hearts of his true servants. As Allah says in the Quran, we will show them our signs in the horizons in the far regions of space and in themselves until it is made clear to them that be translated key or it is the truth or the true reality. Right? You know, in Al Fatiha, you know, Al Fatiha, in that really, it gives you a real concise idea of the message, right? But, you know, it says, Sirat al Mustaqeen. And Sarat al Mustaqim, they translated as the straight path, right? But Mustaqim comes from Paul now, right? It's not Sabil. Sabil is a path going this way, right? Mustaqim is a path going that way. Because it's Paul, right? So the straight path could imply the elevated path of higher consciousness, right? In fact, that's what I think it does. Awareness and understanding. When you stand up, <clears throat> the eyes go out and the head is also on top. So the intellectual heart is the leader. You also are firmly established when you are standing firm on the two feet. says in the Quran, He is who created you and formed you. He is who created you and formed you. 
means that he instilled in you all the potentialities that you have. And he has the wisdom of the extent of that potentiality, right? Meaning that he has measured out all your potentialities, meaning that he has measured out every potentiality of everything in existence, right? Everything has, a, has limits except Allah. Everything has limits. And he has determined those limits. Again, the Quran says in another chapter, the nafsin wa ma sawa. And this wa is God's swear. I swear by the soul and that which shaped it. Right? Now, some people translate this ma as he who shaped it. I like that which shaped it. And the reason why I say that is because it includes all the influences. Not only the creation of God, but all of the influences in the creation. Shape the soul. Right? This is what we've been talking about. Shaping the soul. Then it goes on. Then he inspired its destruction. Right? Fujur comes from Fajr. Fajr means, you know, the dawn. You know, Fajr prayer, the dawn. It, it actually means to break something. Fujur is the plural of it. It means the breaking, right? The destruction of the soul, right? He inspired its destruction, right? Wataqwaha fa'alhamaha fujuraha wataqwaha and he inspired his destruction, taqwa, right? We know that term, right? Taqwa. They translate it as fear and fear of God in a lot of those translations, which I'm translating childhood innocence. Here I would translate as the, the unification of the soul, meaning that the unification of man in his knowledge, right? Here, that's how I would translate it. The very unification of man in his knowledge, right? Because here, the Quran is, is, is the dictionary, not the outside dictionary. You have fujur, which means the breaking of, and you have taqwa, it's opposite. It's placed right there. Wa taqwa and it's integration. Then it goes on. Qat, qat, aflaha man tazakka. And he is successful who purifies it. Right? And he and and failed has he who corrupts it. Now, how do we get to a point? How do we how do we how do we accomplish this integration of the soul that leads to a, a higher form of understanding? of what the human person is. How do we achieve that? How do we achieve that? The Quran gives us some clue. There's a phrase that is highly recurring in the Quran. And it goes like this, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَلِحًا Those who believe and do, works of, and do works of righteousness. Now you have this coupling that's taking place here between faith and works. You cannot, you cannot um, achieve your true purpose, your full potential, unless you have integrated or integrated your inner life with your outer life. Your inner life and your outer life have to be integrated in order for you to evolve as a human person, in order for you to rise as the the, the human being that you are, you have to integrate these two. There's no other way. Faith without works is no good. And works without faith is no good. Right? But even work and faith unintegrated is not good either. Right? 
like that doctor who studies medicine. He approaches medicine first, that these facts that I'm learning are a revelation of God. Only secondly does he attribute that information to man. It's all about perspective, right? The Quran says, so whoever Allah intends to guide, he expands his heart for Islam. But here it doesn't mean Islam with a small eye. It means Islam with a big eye. For the, for the submission, um, the submission to what God wants. And whoever intends to, uh, intends to, um, he in, and whoever he intends to leave in error, he makes his heart constricted and narrow. As though he were ascending upwards in the sky. You know, when you read this verse, as, as though ascending upward in the sky, when you pronounce this word in Arabic, the throat constricts. When you actually pronounce the word, the throat constricts. And when you when you climb a mountain very high, you see, the Quran is trying to give you a metaphorical image of constriction, but it's a spiritual constriction, not a physical constriction, but it's using a metaphor that has to do with something in real life. When you climb mountains, oxygen is, you don't have a lot of oxygen at the top of the mountain. So you're breathing, so your lungs become constrained, and you can't breathe, right? And when you pronounce this verse, the same thing happens, right? But it's talking about this integration. So, I'll stop here. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, 
Ar-Rahman Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'abudu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Ladina Ramta Alayhim Ghayru Mahdi Alayhim Your health, home, family, food, and finances. Did you know that taking a test before your child is born may improve the odds of your child doing well on tests? That food allergies may make it harder to lose weight? Or that there's a new technique to treat snoring? Consumer Science News and Notes will explain these interesting facts and offer useful and intriguing information. Keep a pen and paper handy. During the program, we will tell you where to send for free brochures and information packets. The United States Fire Administration offers a few tips to help prevent fires at your home. First, don't use a kitchen oven range to heat your home during colder weather. Oven ranges can be a fire hazard and a source of toxic fumes. Keep space heaters and wood stoves at least three feet from anything combustible. Make sure wood stoves have proper floor support and adequate ventilation. Fireplaces must have a glass or metal screen to prevent sparks from igniting nearby carpets and furniture. Be sure that all furnace controls and emergency shutoffs work well. Leave furnace repairs to qualified specialists. Never leave cooking unattended. Double check to see that all appliances are off before going to bed or leaving the house. For more fire safety information, visit the United States Fire Administration at www.usfa.fema.gov. More than half of all U.S. households own a pet, but one in four of these pets may wind up in an animal shelter. To make pet adoptions more successful, experts recommend that owners follow four pet pointers. First, discuss the rules of pet behavior with your family before your new pet comes home. This will improve the odds that your new pet receives a consistent message. Spay or neuter your cat or dog to prevent unwanted litters. Proper training is very important. New puppies or dogs not accustomed to staying alone can bark or howl. Get pet references from a vet, just in case you move. They may help persuade a prospective landlord that your pet will be well behaved. A free booklet called The ABCs of Responsible Pet Ownership is available at animal shelters and humane societies. For a free copy, visit www.febreze.com. 
Increasingly, people are rediscovering the simple joys of craft projects, spending time with family members, and creating handmade delights with scissors, paper, and glue. According to experts at the Hobby Industry Association, successful family crafting starts with organization and a sense of humor. Get the kids involved by letting them sort materials by shapes and colors. Create craft projects on paper plates or mats for easy cleanup. When looking for project ideas, turn to your local craft store. Many craft retailers offer free project sheets and in-store demonstrations and are happy to help their customers choose age-appropriate materials. You can learn more about crafting, including the National Craft Month Cherish the Moment promotion on the Internet. Log on to www.i-craft.com for craft tips, project ideas, and contest opportunities during National Craft Month and all year long. Moms who want their children to be good at taking tests can start by taking a thyroid test before the child is born. The test, called a TSH test, measures how well the thyroid gland works. The test is important because a mother's untreated thyroid deficiency can negatively affect a child's brain development. Preventing thyroid deficiency can avoid lower IQ scores, difficulties in motor skills, attention, language, and reading. A recent study found that women with untreated thyroid deficiency during pregnancy were nearly four times more likely to have children with significantly lower IQ scores. One in 50 women have an underactive thyroid during pregnancy. The study was conducted by the Foundation for Blood Research with support from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, a division of the National Institutes of Health. If you are expecting, it may be a smart idea to discuss this test with your doctor.